All right, off we go. So let's finish these slides about logic circuits and binary. Really, we only have binary left. We talked about it just briefly. So uh, last non-programming lecture, I was getting into this idea, right? We have numbers as humans that we use, base 10, decimal numbers made up of 10 digits, 0 through 9. Just some combination of those makes every number that we understand. And so I'll write numbers that are decimal with a subscript 10 to remind us that I'm thinking in decimal. And then we talked about binary. Binary is base 2, so there's only two digits to work with. And so once you add 1 and 1, the number 2 is 1, 0 in base 2. There's no more room in that in that one's place for another digit. We've run out. And so we got your bits, which are binary digits. Bytes are just eight consecutive binary digits, whatever uh, they are. And we go from there. So that's binary. Hopefully we're all remembering it. But here is how you can do cool stuff with it. Let me show you how to convert from binary to decimal. All right. So remember uh, the subscript. So like this is not the number 10,010. This is the number 10010 in binary. It, it really represents uh, 248. It represents the number 18. All right. And I'll, I'll teach you how to convert in just a second. This base 10 is the 42 you know and love. Okay. So the way to convert from binary to decimal to figure out like what number this really means is to do a decimal expansion, to do a base expansion uh, with every place. So you remember how you did this in like middle school when you learned about powers? Like this is the thousands place. One, 1,234 is equal to like 1,000 plus 200 plus 30 plus 40. Remember doing that? And then once you learned about powers, you could break it down in a cooler way. Like this is one times 10 to the three plus two times, what's the hundreds place, but 10 to the square, right? 10 squared plus three times 10 to the one plus four times 10 to the zero. And what do you know? I'm breaking down this number into its constituent digits and look at where the base appears. It's taken to a power each time. Interesting. So this, this pattern applies to binary. That's where I'm going with this. So this number, 10010 in binary, you just do, you play the same game. All right, this is equal to, usually start from the right, because this is like the two to the zeros place. And you start counting up. So this is, all right, let's do this digit. Zero times two to the zero. Plus, all right, here's the one. One times two to the one. Plus zero times two squared. See how I'm just using a different base now? Two squared instead of ten squared. Plus another zero times 2 cubed, I could have just gotten rid of that, I guess, plus a 1, finally, times 2 to the 4. So that's what that number is really. That's what it represents. And so if we get rid of the zeros, it's 1 times 2 to the 4 plus 2 to the 1, which is 2, 4, 8, 16, plus 2, which is 18. That's the decimal number that this binary number represents. All right, that kind of expansion is all you have to do to convert numbers. All right, are there any questions about that? So you do the same kind of thing you did for your normal numbers. Just instead of 10 times stuff, it's 2 times stuff. That's the expansion that we're doing. Okay? That's how you figure out what this binary number really meant in decimal. Let me go with that. All right, so let me give you this. I'll make it tiny for a second. Um, my computer is doing so many things. Let's see if it actually records properly. We'll, we'll find out one way or another. Uh, here's an exercise for you. I'll give you a couple minutes to try it. Hopefully it's easier to see if you're on Zoom right now. So here is a binary number, 1111. So like the biggest four-bit number. I would like you to figure out what that is in decimal using this power expansion, all right? So this, this thing that I just talked about, use that to convert 1111 in binary to decimal. What number is that really representing? Because it's definitely not 1111, okay? So take a couple minutes, help each other and try to find the answer. You don't have to write it down anywhere, but maybe I'll ask for a volunteer. Take like two minutes to see if you can do the expansion for that. Convert binary to decimal.
All right, that's my very loud timer. Did we get it? Did anybody come up with an answer? I'm not cheap? Yeah, what did you get? Uh, nice. I believe that is correct. So hopefully a lot of other, uh, more of us got 15 as well, but here's how you walk through it. Here's how you do it. Usually you start from the rightmost digit because that's your two to the zeros place. That's one times two to the zero plus, they're all ones, right? right? One times two to the one plus. One times two squared plus. One times two cubed. And so if you do all those out, it's two, four, eight plus four plus two plus one, which is 15. 15 base 10. All right? Any questions about that? Does that make enough sense? Good job if you got it. So that's the biggest 4-bit number. Not quite 16. You need another place for that. Another digit. That's the 2 to the 4's place. That would be representing the number 16. Okay, so that's uh, how you convert from binary to decimal. Figure out what some random binary number that I give you really is. Sadly, the other way is harder. If I give you a decimal number, like 15, and I ask you to convert it to binary, that way takes a bit more work. So pay a bit more attention now. So here's here's the algorithm to do it the other way. If you want to go from decimal to binary, uh, you have to repeatedly take, uh, you have to repeatedly divide, and then not only get the quotient, but also the remainder. You have to worry about the remainder after dividing. We haven't really probably worried about remainders since elementary school or something. So uh, here's the idea. Um, we would like to do this. This is the, the key. I'll do it in decimal, just like I did the expansion in decimal first. There's going to be a pattern. We're going to notice the pattern and then apply it. All right. So here's the key. How can we extract all the digits from the number 123? Pretend like I am thinking of this number. It's really 123, but I won't tell you, but I will let you divide it. I will let you divide it, and I'll let you take remainders. And you can figure out, with just those things, what number it is that I'm thinking of. Okay? So 123, how would you extract the digits of it? How would you get, like, the 1 out? How would you get the 2 out? How would you get the 3 out? And here's the pattern. You can get the 3. You can always work from the right. Uh, you can get the rightmost digit of any number by dividing by 10. All right? Because if you take 123 and you divide it by 10... What do you get? You get 12, right? 12.3, but if we go back to like elementary school when we were first learning division, we did 12 remainder three. Remember that before we learned about fractions or anything? And this is a smaller number, and this is the last digit, that remainder. We could get the remainder. We could find the last digit of any number, okay? So the rightmost digit is our remainder. And then, now that we know how to get the rightmost digit of any number, how can I just transform 123 into 12? Because then I can do the same thing all over again and get the 2. And then do the same thing and get the 1. Yeah? Keep making it smaller, chopping off its last digit. How can I do that? Well, again, you divide. Just take the result without the remainder. That is the smaller number that you can then go and extract the digits from. Okay? So divide by 10 and throw away the remainder. All right? And then once you hit zero at the end of all that, you're done. And here is an operation. I'll teach it to you in Python eventually, but it's called, uh, I'm going to write it as a percent sign because that's how it is in Python. So if I say this, one, two, three, percent sign 10, this is called the modulus operation. Modulus. And what it does is it divides and then gives you back the remainder. So 123 modulus 10, I'll say mod 10 for short. 123 mod 10, that would give me back my 3. It gives me the remainder after dividing by 10. Okay, that's the percent operation. Okay, so with the percent operation and the division operation that throws away the remainder, we will be able to extract the digits of any number. Okay, and let me show you how to do that for just our normal 123. Let me extract 1, 2, and 3 from 123. All right, first I'll do mod 10, because that'll get me the rightmost digit, that'll get me my 3. And then I want to make 123 smaller. I want to turn it into 12. And I could do that by dividing by 10 and throwing the throwing away the remainder. Right? Don't forget that. Throw away the remainder. Chop off the decimal places. Remainder. All right? And now I'll get me the 12. And now I can do the same thing with the 12. I can extract the 2 by using mod 10 again. It goes in once with 2 left over. Right? And then I want to 
get rid of that 2 so I can have a smaller number to extract the digits from. So 12 divide by 10, chop off the remainder. And that's 1.2, chop off the 0.2 is just 1, all right? Now I need to extract all the digits from the number 1. How do I do that? 1 mod 10, try to divide by 10, you get 0 with a remainder of 1, and then chop off all the 1s, chop off that last digit of the number 1 by dividing by 10 and throwing away the remainder. The answer then is 0, and that is when the algorithm completes itself and it's done extracting all the digits and so here's what happened every time you took a modulus every time you got the remainder you got a digit of your number in reverse order so if I wasn't if I was mean and I didn't tell you what the number was you could extract all the digits this way if you could just divide and take the modulus operation and get the remainder all right so the number was one two three does that make enough sense that's how you can extract the digits of any number and look at a nice thing that makes a lot of sense, if I wanted the decimal digits, I used mod 10, divide by 10, because it's base 10. If I would like the binary digits, the bits, I will just change this to a 2. Instead of dividing by 10, I'll extract the rightmost bit by mod 2. I'll shift away that rightmost bit by dividing by 2, throwing away the remainder. Okay? That's the secret. It's a bit more difficult because you gotta, gotta like write this all out. But uh, once you understand it, I think it makes enough sense. So here is the algorithm now. Converting from decimal to binary. So you're gonna repeatedly extract the rightmost digit, not in decimal, but in binary, using this mod two operation. And then you're gonna shift it away, like cross off that binary version of that rightmost bit. And you get that by dividing by two and throwing away that remainder. So here's the process all over again. So starting with eight, let me convert that. Let me extract all the binary digits of 8. So 8, and so here's the pattern. It's, I want the rightmost, not decimal digit, but binary digit. I'll do mod 2. 8 mod 2. And this is an even number, so it goes in four times cleanly with 0 left over. And that's the rightmost bit of 8 in binary. And now I want to shift away that rightmost 0 that I just discovered. And so to get rid of it from 8... Even though I'm doing decimal arithmetic, it still works. I'll do 8 divided by 2, throwing away any remainders. And there isn't any, so it's just 4. right? And now I convert 4 to binary, remembering to plop a 0 at the end of it. That's the trick. So now I'm working with 4. What's its rightmost bit? Mod 2. 0, because it's even. Uh, all right, shift away that 0 by integer dividing by 2, throwing away any uh, decimal places. So 2 is left. All right, extract all the bits of 2. What's the rightmost bit of 2? Oh, it's 0 goes in cleanly. Uh, all right, let's shift away that two, that zero in binary by dividing by two and throwing away any remainders. Okay, it's one. All right, let's get the rightmost bit of the number one in binary. One mod two. That is one, finally. And then let's shift away that one from the number one in binary form by dividing by two and throwing away the remainder. And that gives me, of course, zero. And so here's the secret. Every time I took a remainder, every time I did the modulus operation, I got a bit of the number in reverse order. So, reading backwards, the answer is 1, 0, 0, 0, base 2. That's what 8 is in binary. Any questions about that? And you can totally check it easily, because it's like 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3. Oh, 2, 4, 8. You can always check your answer, but that's the process. You're doing mod 2 divide by 2. Any questions about that? It's a weird little thing, but uh, once you get the hang of it, it does make sense, I hope. So the only way to force you to get the hang of it is to make you try it. So here's another question for you. I'll give you this slide, though. Try it for 25. Try it for the number 25. All right, and here's the process all over again. But starting with 25, extract all the bits of it, convert it to binary. All right, I'll give you another two minutes to try that. Please help each other and yell at me if you have any questions. Maybe it's been a while since we thought about remainders, but now we care a whole lot.
I think any calculator app like on Windows, I think if you switch it to like programmer mode or something, it should be able to do uh, remainder calculations. Is it trying to start? Here's my here's my calculator app, and if you go to programmer mode, not standard mode, but programmer mode you should have this percent sign operation now, like 25, I'm sorry, clear, delete, 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 clear. There we go, 25 mod two equals, and then it shows one. So yeah, if you go to the programmer version of the calculator, that is one easy way to do this, but I think mod two is not too bad. It's just, is it, if it's odd, it's a one. If it's even, it goes in cleanly and there's zero left over. All right, so um, let me walk you through how I might do it. All right, and then you can compare your answer to mine. 25, I'm extracting all the bits of 25, converted to binary. So 25, I want the rightmost bit of that, so I do mod two. It's an odd number, so it's a one. There's one left over. It goes in, what, 14 times, no, 12 times with a remainder of one. And then I want to shift away that one bit out of the number 25. Even though I'm working in decimal, I can still, it still works in this way. Uh, 25 divide by two, throw away the decimal places. So that's just 12, because it's 12 remainder one, 12 and a half. So just 12. And now I want to convert 12 to binary. All right, so I'll work with 12, get its rightmost bit. Mod two, it's even, so zero. Shift away that zero by divide by two and cross off any decimal places. Throw away the remainder, so I have six. Get six into binary, what's its rightmost bit? Zero, because it's even. Six, divide by two to get the rest. Throwing away decimal places, throwing away remainders, just three. What is the rightmost bit of three in binary? Well, it's odd, so there's a one there. And let's shift away that one by doing divide by two, throwing away decimal places. So that's 1.5, so just one, right? And then, all right, let's convert one to binary, which is Kind of, you're done, but let's just keep going. One mod two, what's well, the rightmost bit of one? It's just one. And all right, let's shift away that one out of the number to see if I have any other things, any other smaller numbers to convert to binary. And so one divide by two, throw away the remainder is zero, and that's when I am finished, all right? So if you read it off backwards, you have the answer every time you took a modulus. So it's one, one, zero, zero, one. All right, one, one, zero, zero, one, base two, that is 25. And because I taught you the other way, it's very easy to check your answer. Did we get this one? This is like the two to the zeros place. So or this is the two to the zero, so that's the one's place, the two's place, the four's place, the eight's place, the 16's place. And so this is 16 plus eight plus one, which is uh, 24 plus one, which is 25, in fact. So it, it did work out, all right? And that's how you can check yourself. Are there any questions about the process, though? Um, yeah. So if the uh, modulus is uh, the odd number, it's going to be, uh, be 1 no matter what? Yeah, because it's always the answer is 0. 0.5 if you divide by 2, and that's 1 over 2, one okay. remainder 1. Yeah. That's a good way to remember it. Odd versus even. That's how I do it, at least. Any other questions? All right. Uh, with that in mind, uh, let me show you what your, what your computer does all day long. It doesn't add numbers in decimal, it adds them in binary, because it works in binary. So let me show you how to add binary numbers, just real quick. Why not? Pretty easy. It's all right, it's just like you would normally do, it's just you're working with binary numbers. So these are two binary numbers that I'm adding and I'm computing another binary number. So this is one plus one. That's the number two, right? But what is two in binary? It's one zero. So I immediately have to carry one zero. I ran out of room in my decimal place, in, in my binary place, I guess. And again, I have one plus zero plus one. That's again two, which is one zero. I have to carry. All right. 
Now I have one plus one plus one, that's three. In binary, that's one, one. So I carry, and then I also put a one in this place, all right? And again, I have one, one, one plus one plus one, which is three, which is one, one in binary. And now I'm finished with all the places. So I just put that in the answer, all right? So that is how you solve it. That's how you add binary numbers and don't have to convert back and forth. And so what was this really doing? It was adding uh, 8 plus 4 plus 1. So it was adding 13 to, and we know what this one is. It's 15, right? We computed that. And then it computed 28. And this is what 28 is. It's uh, 16 plus 8 plus 4, which, yeah, checks out. Yeah, so that's how you add binary numbers. Uh, it's just 1 plus 1, you immediately have to add a new place because you've run out of digits. Does that make enough sense? It's a little weird. But that's what your computers are doing. They're converting back to decimal just to show you the answer. Fun idea. All right. Uh, yeah, a couple more slides for this set of slides, and we'll do some other ones, switch gears. But uh, let me show you something cool. Let me show you how your computer's doing all this stuff, because like, why would I teach you this if it wasn't useful? Uh, let me answer this question for you really quick. How does my computer use this idea of binary and like Boolean algebra or truth tables and or and not and all the circuit kind of stuff that we learned before, all these things, logic gates. How does all this come together? And why did I teach you about binary? How does this all come together? How does your computer do any of this? How does it work, all right? If you stare long enough at the truth table for exclusive or, Remember, it was like true, exclusive or, true is false. True, exclusive or, zero, or true, exclusive or, false is true. It's only true if they're like different. It's like one or the other. That's the only time it's true. It's false every other way. If you stare at it long enough and you squint, exclusive or, converting one, true to one and zero to false, exclusive or is really doing addition. If you think about it, like one plus one, as far as one bit is concerned, has to carry a one, but the answer is zero, right? And that's what exclusive or would give you. One plus zero is one, zero plus one is one. That's what exclusive or gives you on true and false. And then zero, exclusive or zero, and zero plus zero is, of course, zero. So exclusive or is doing addition on a single bit. Ooh. And then you also have to figure out if you need to carry. You have to carry if they're both a one. So you can compute, hey, are they both a carry by seeing if they're both true? A and B, because that's the only time it's true if they're both true. So it it's true if we need to carry if they're both one. So you can compute a circuit for that. You can compute, you can take these two digits, these two bits, and add them together with exclusive or and get a sum for that small bit. And then you'll also have a carry to propagate. And the carry is true if they're both true. So you and them together with an and gate. Isn't that cool? So that's how you do one bit of addition in your computer, and you can chain this. You're eventually going to need to worry about like incoming carries, so you actually really have to add three things. You have to exclusive or twice, like you're adding two number two two bits and then also a carry in, all right? So exclusive or twice to add them, get the sum, and then figure out if you need to carry out as well. Like all right, we had a carry coming in, boop, and we had a carry going out to the next guy to the next digit. And so your computer also has to think about that. So it transforms, given all these things, like it's seeing, is any of those one? If so, or them together. And I need to carry out to the next person. This is fed into the next bit that I'm adding. So if you just chain a bunch of these things called full adders together, uh, you can add an arbitrary number of bits in your numbers, and your computers have 64 of these chained together. Usually they're doing 64-bit addition. So, uh, yeah, that is... I don't expect you to memorize this or anything. It's just a cool fact. This is why I'm teaching you this. This is what your computer is doing. All this stuff is coming together right here and now. Your computer is using exclusive or and AND gates, essentially, to add numbers and do everything else that lives inside of your computer and compute. But that's like the simplest thing that I could explain. Any questions, comments about that? Just a fun fact. If this interests you and you're not already a computer science major, become one and wait until CSI 45. You'll learn about that in a bit more detail. All right, we good? All right, I have another set of slides to get through in the remaining time. 
about a completely different, more philosophical topic again. Let's talk about privacy and encryption, right? So, uh, obviously, we live in the digital age. We are using things that are connected all the time, our phones, our computers. Uh, how do we remain private? Do we even have a right to privacy on the internet? And then how do we make sure that if we do want to stay private, how do we ensure that our information that's transmitted across like the school's internet fiber line or your home's Comcast cable line all the way to where you want it to go without anybody snooping on it, right? So let's talk about all that. All right, so yeah, let's, let's talk about privacy first. Uh, feel free to read the funny pictures after I submit the PDF. But yeah, let's talk about is there even privacy, like, on the internet? It's definitely a philosoph philosophical question that I could ask you about, right? So let's talk about uh, the Fourth Amendment, right? If we remember from history class or government class, that's the one that is prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures, all right? So we have that right as American citizens. Other countries have their own version of it or none at all. Does that apply to us is the main question. So with the Fourth Amendment, to like have police search your home, they need a warrant. They need a warrant. They need probable cause. That's the only way that a judge will usually give that warrant or approve of it, right? So uh, the Internet, though, is not a house. It is virtual. It is not real. Uh, anybody could be there at, at the same time, right, in one place. So it's a different kind of place. It's not physical. So uh, does the Fourth Amendment apply? So... Uh, there is some interesting case law about this, if you want to get into it. It's a fun Wikipedia deep dive, if you want to go there one day. But uh, back in the day, the Supreme Court ruled that you did not need a warrant to tap a phone and listen in on somebody else's conversation. They ruled that the police did not need to get a warrant, uh, since a conversation was not physical. It was not a home that you could intrude on. It was just something traveling along the telephone wires. Okay? And so that was uh, kind of foreshadowing to maybe future issues. But luckily, they changed their view. They changed their mind. They're allowed to do that in the 60s. And they're like, all right, you do need a warrant to tap a phone because now everybody has one and they assume some amount of privacy. Okay? So that's quite nice. So maybe this kind of, this is, this is good for us on the internet because the internet's essentially the same as me talking to somebody on the phone. Maybe. Okay? So that's the Fourth Amendment. That's what that gives us. Um, and I guess maybe it applies a little bit to the internet, right? Now I have some fun stories. So target data mining is the first one. Um, so maybe you haven't heard the term data mining before. I mean, it's maybe a buzzword that's been around, but, uh, maybe you never fully understood it. All data mining means is just a glorified term for pattern recogni recognition using computer programs. So it's just pattern finding. You have a big, long Excel spreadsheet of data, and you want to go and look for patterns in it. So you can, like, advertise to people who may be interested in things. And this was this is where this came in, all right? This is this example. So it happens if you take your large Excel spreadsheet of everything everyone ever buys, and you, like, map it to who bought it, it turns out that when you're pregnant, you end up buying a lot of products at certain stages of your pregnancy, which makes a bit of sense, and target as well as I'm sure other corporations figured that out. Like they're able to track the purchase history of people because they're always swiping the same credit card or something like that. And uh, so they took that data and they ended up sending targeted, which is a very fun pun. I'm very proud of myself for writing it. They ended up sending targeted coupons and ads to those women because they knew they were going to eventually need this thing because everybody else wanted it too around that time in their pregnancy. All right, so they didn't even, they just kind of guessed that the women were pregnant based on what they bought and they started giving them ads. Okay? And so the question is, does this infringe on the privacy of the target shoppers? Them doing this and sending out ads to people. All right? So, uh, again, there's no right answer, but you can ask the, uh, the Kantianists and the utilitarians, and here's what they might use to, to figure out their answer. All right? So Kant might have asked, should everyone always do this? Should everyone always look at purchase histories and try and give out ads to people uh, to ensure that uh, the company makes a lot of money? And Kant was very much pro-individual rights. And so I think he would say no to this, but you can probably find a way to, to like skew his words and argue the other way. I think it's easiest to argue that Kant would be against this. He was 
pro-individual rights, not using people as a means to an end. And this kind of sounds like using people as a means to make more money. Okay. So I think Kant would say no. And then utilitarians would weigh the options, right? They would weigh the options. Should we be mining the data of all of our purchasers? Uh, is there utility in this would be their question that they would ask, right? So, uh, well, you have to weigh it. Maybe because these women were going to buy those products anyway, right? It was very likely that they would. That's the whole reason they found this in data mining and started giving out those ads to kind of make sure that they went to Target to buy those items rather than Walmart or somewhere else. So the women ended up getting the things that they wanted, maybe cheaper. So does that increase total utility? Maybe it does. So there's a yes that we could argue. And of course, you can also argue the other thing, the other way. Like, as a utilitarian, you could weigh it and end up saying, no, this, this sounds wrong because it's infringing on the privacy of the, of the target shoppers. And maybe that, that outweighs any gain in, uh, like, them spending less, right? They shouldn't have done this in the first place. If they really wanted a coupon, they could just put their coupons on the internet and have whoever wants it printed out, Okay. So that is just a fun little story uh, giving us another example of how to weigh our ethical dilemmas. Okay, are there any questions about that? So it's another example of privacy. Questions, comments? Have we heard about this? I think it's been a while since this happened. It was like mid-2010s or something. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, I think I remember that. Yes, I think I remember that as well. And so that is, again, a very, very strong case for privacy like that. They shouldn't have been doing that because some people, they live at the same household and they don't want to know, want other people to know that they are pregnant yet. Right. So that is a very important thing to bring up. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? These are just fun ideas and they're getting us uh, to put our critical thinking cap on. Right. All right. Next example of kind of privacy kind of stuff. Let's go to ad blockers. So I definitely use an ad blocker. This is this, this is one of these cases where like I I think so strongly one way, you cannot convince me otherwise. But I'm going to give you both sides. So ad blockers are just things that you can install on your browser to make sure you don't see any ads. All right, and it's it's not illegal to use an ad blocker. It's not illegal to block ads, but it is technically illegal to block ad blocker detectors on websites. So have you ever got like like you see something on Reddit and it links to the New York Times and you click on it and it's like, you scroll for a little bit and it's like, please buy a subscription if you would like to keep reading this. Your ad blocker is, even though if you have it, if you have an ad blocker installed, you're still going to see that because it's illegal to block the ad blocker detectors or uh, to block the, hey, you need to get a subscription button. All right. And the reason for that is once you start blocking ad blocker detectors, like it comes up, it's like, please disable your ad blocker. Like maybe I see that on Duolingo, Duolingo all the time because I have the free version of it. And it's like, oh, we would have put an ad here if you didn't have an ad blocker. But uh, it's illegal to block the detection of that. All right. Because you're tampering with access control and websites have a right to control the access to the things that they provide, like copyrighted content for the, for the New York Times, for example. So it's illegal to make an add-on that would block the, that would all, like always show you the article rather than having that pop-up come up and ask you to sign it, okay? That would be illegal. And same idea with blocking little squares that are like, hey, you have an ad blocker. Can't block that, all right? So I hope that makes enough sense. You're not allowed to tamper with access control, at least in this country. And so the question is, should, uh, should ad blockers even exist in the first place? All right. So there's things that you're allowed to do, things that you're not allowed to do. And they kind of stay within the, the gray area that is ad blocking. But is it worth it to block ads in the first place? And again, we could ask our boys. Let's say, let's see what Kant might think. All right. This is, this is you block, by the way, or maybe it's you block. Install that on your, on your Chrome or your Firefox, please. So Kant might ask this. Should we always like, is it worth it to always block ads? Should we always look at or click on ads? That's what Kant would probably ask himself. Should we always do this? Should we always take advantage of the ads that are given to us by like reading through them, even though they're not part of the thing I really wanted to go to this website for? Should we always buy the products that they're advertising? And the answer would definitely be no. 
even though these things are being thrown in our place, uh, thrown in our face, we don't have to look at them. So they're not part of the article that we're trying to read, right? We just scroll through it. And so Kant would be pro ad blockers, probably. It's like, I wasn't going to look at this anyway. So why, why had it? All right. So that's an argument for ad blockers. And uh, then you can ask the utilitarians the same question. And again, you'd have to weigh the options. What are the benefits of having ad blocking? Uh, well, here's one. It's like you get more real content on your page, real content. I don't know if any of you have iPhones, but if you click a link on an iPhone, you can't really install an ad blocker very easily on one. So you scroll through like a Fresno B page or something and like it's just ad after ad rather than it would look like uh, it looks so beautiful on a normal web browser with an ad blocker. So there's more real content. You can actually read the article you're trying to get at with an ad blocker. But, uh, and maybe that increases total, ut total utility so that you think that ad blockers are a good thing. But on the flip side, maybe it's a bad idea to have ad blockers because like it would, the idea of the companies that are using them, like they're making this website available to you, they have to pay for hosting and they're putting these ads up so that they can make enough money to keep showing you this website. The people who made that website and who are showing you ads would get less money if you use an ad blocker because they get paid by view. And if you're not downloading the ad picture, then they're not getting paid, right? And so maybe for certain websites, uh, they make so little money if everybody uses an ad blocker and that's their only source of revenue, they would go away and that would decrease total, util total utility. It's hard for me to say that for some reason. Because so many people wanted to go to that website, right? Or they didn't want to pay or something. It was supposed to be free, but with ads. So that is an argument for uh, getting rid of ad blockers. So an argument for ad blockers and an argument against them. I think the utilitarians would uh, find one or the other thing to say. And then I think Kant would always say, ad blockers are cool. Let's use them. So those are my thoughts. Would you agree? That, that Kant would say that and that the utilitarians might argue against themselves. Because it is hard to, to weigh that, that utility. That's just another example of privacy on the internet. And let's go to cultural ideas as well, because uh, Google Street View, which I use all the time, like I want to, I'm trying to go somewhere that I've never been before. What does it look like outside? Like, where do I turn in? Street View is great for that. I'm sure you've tried it. Uh, here is a map of Google Street View. Like it's blue if all the, if there are roads with Google Street View enabled. Uh, and look at how we just easily can see Germany not colored blue. So it just so happens that Germans don't like the idea of Street View as much as the rest of their Western European friends, as well as uh, us Americans. Not everyone thinks the same thing about privacy, even though we are, we're pretty similar to Germans in a lot of respects, right? Uh, Google Street View exists pretty much everywhere in Europe except for Germany. Only very like large cities have a few streets or so mapped. And the reason is a cultural reason, except for Germany. So culturally, it just so happens that Germans are a bit more mindful of their privacy uh, and so they've made laws that make it very easy to opt out of Street View. Like, I don't want my house anywhere near Street View. Get it off of there. I don't want anybody seeing pictures of my house, of people walking on the street in my city, stuff like that. That is what they believe. And that is completely different to what a lot of Americans believe. It's just a different cultural view. Okay. Even though it's another, uh, it's a Western European country. And so there, we have a lot in common, just not Street View. Okay. I hope that makes enough sense. So that is uh, culture can get in the way of, of technology as well and argue for privacy. Okay. Just wanted to tell you that because uh, some people think differently than us and it's important to understand them and understand them. Any questions about that before I talk about encryption? We've got about half an hour left, plenty of time. All right. So let's talk about encryption now, because when we're on the internet, we want to make sure like when we go to our bank's website that like Comcast or anybody on my Wi-Fi is not looking at my bank statement and like stealing my money. So how do you do that? How do you ensure that you encrypt all of your internet traffic these days? Encryption, it's just the process of encoding information. 
making it into a form that only my computer and the computer on the other end, like in my, at my bank, can understand. All right. Here's the idea. So only the parties a message is intended for, because that's what computers do. They send messages, virtual messages to each other. Only the parties that a message is intended for are supposed to be able to decode that message. And so there's a concept of messages. It's like a network transaction. And like I'm sending my password or something and I'm getting my bank statement back. Those are messages being sent back and forth. And then decoding the message is the, uh, the ability to take that encoded, encrypted thing and get back at like what it was supposed to be like, oh, this is the password I sent my bank. And only they were able to decode it and check that I was me. Okay, so most of today we are using encryption all the time, even if we don't think about it. Uh, we use it for security, right? Security mostly, like logging in on websites, uh, making sure like our accounts are only accessed by us, nobody's getting our Netflix, and commerce. If we want to buy something, we have to enter in not just our password usually, but also our credit card. And sometimes websites even save that. And so we want to make sure like, oh, that's super nice and safe. Okay, so that's how we use encryption today. And so it just makes sure, right, if you encode this thing, you, you encode your credit card because you want to send it to Amazon and you don't trust anybody along the way. Like maybe you have Comcast internet, Xfinity or whatever, and you're sending it to Com you're sending it through Comcast's internet pipes to Amazon. Encryption ensures that only Amazon saw your password. All right, that's the idea. So here is like the world's simplest encryption scheme, and then we'll talk about a fancier one. So here's a very simple encryption scheme. It is completely broken, but the Romans used to use it, right, to, to exchange battle messages or something. It's called the Caesar cipher, all right? Also called ROT13, and ROT is short for rotate, rotate by 13. Uh, this will be very apparent once I explain it. So rotate 13. And here's the encryption. Uh, if you have a message that you want to send somebody and it's just made up of text, Here's how you encrypt it. You shift every letter of the alphabet 13 away. So like A becomes 13 uh, letters later, which is apparently N. Like A gets encrypted to N. And instead of writing B, that means you're going to write O instead because that's 13 characters later in the alphabet. So if you just shift everything, uh, just like add 13 to every number essentially, then if you were trying to send the message hello to somebody, you would encode that in the Caesar cipher in ROT13 land as Uryib, apparently, because like 13 later from H is U, right? 13 later from E is R, and that's how it works. So that is the encryption scheme, and the nice thing about the Caesar cipher is you just do it again, and it becomes unencrypted, because there's 13 is exactly 26 over 2, right? And there's 26 letters in the alphabet, so if you rotate the encrypted thing like h went to u if you rotate u again and you like wrap back around to a once you get past z if you do 13 characters later after u you get back to h actually so it is its own inverse which is fun so just like you run this backwards on the end of the battlefield and you get the original message again that was meant for you so that was an, a very easy way to encrypt things obviously it's kind of broken because you can just use uh what are called frequency attacks to solve this, because like you know that vowels appear more often in everything than normal letters, and so you'd be able to very quickly discover all the vowels, and then from there like extract the real text. But uh, this was like state of the art back in the day, and this is the Caesar cipher, ROT13. Just shift everything by 13 characters, wrapping around the, the alphabet when you need to, and that gives you a way to send something to somebody, and hopefully a few people won't understand it. Right? So that's, that's encryption, though. We're forming a new message that is encrypted, that can be decoded by somebody who knows the, uh, the way we're doing things. Okay? That's a simple example. Let me show you a very complicated example now. Uh, let's see. Do I want to show you that? Uh, sure, why not? So remember to sign in for attendance, but... Uh, if you go to anywhere on a website, let me put this down here, I guess. If you go to anywhere on a website, usually you see this lock because it's HTTPS, right? You go to Canvas, you go to the class website, there are locks everywhere. And so it just means that your connection is secure. And you can click on that and see more information about why the connection is secure. You can go over here and it's like, all right, uh, this is the website. It is, I am encrypted with TLS, blah, 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 RSA, AES. 
128-bit keys. You know what that means now. Uh, the very long uh, string, but it's telling you exactly why we trust this website. And like, there's a certificate involved. And it's telling you the encryption type. And uh, there's something called a public key. The algorithm is called RSA. And it's used on the internet all the time to uh, encrypt stuff. So there's a fancy encryption algorithm called RSA that is unbroken that is used all over the internet. It's used on Canvas right now. It's used on my class website, every website that you connect to. Let me teach you about this thing called RSA. It is advanced encryption. Take CSI 26 if you're interested in it. But the idea in RSA, this is a, it's an acronym involving the, the last letters of everybody, or the, the first letters of everybody's last name who invented it. So famous people came together and invented this encryption scheme called RSA. What it needs to do RSA, you need two things. You need uh, a uh, you need a key, and actually you need two kinds of keys. All right. So here is the secret. Um, how do I want to say this? So yeah, there are two types of keys. There's called a public key. You make a a certain kind of key to encryption for other people to use, publicly available, out in the open. You just tell everybody, here is my public key, and they can send you a message encrypted using that public key. So here's the message somebody wants to send you, a little cloud bubble of, of words. You give them this thing called your public key, which is just a big number, and that gets transformed then, that transforms their message into an encrypted form. It's like a black box that only you are able to decrypt, all right? So you give away a public key and people use that to what's called sign their messages to you. And uh, you decrypt it with something called a private key that you keep secret, all right? So there's, a, there's two types of keys and that's how you do RSA. This was invented back in the 70s. It is so secure that it's still used today. You just make the numbers bigger. It just all works out. You need like a government's amount of CPU power to decrypt anything these days. And if you make it big enough, it would take years for somebody, or centuries, for somebody to decrypt a message that you sent, which is fun. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a private key that goes along with this public key that you don't tell anybody about, and that allows you to decrypt the message that they sent you. So this can be decrypted with a private key, all right? So here is the idea. Uh, here is you. Here is you, and somebody wants to send you something. So you make a private key and a public key. So you have your private key just to you, I will, yeah, you'll use for decryption. And then you have a public key that you give to anybody who wants to talk to you. So like if here's a sender of a message who wants to talk to you, you give them your public key, public key. And let me write that slightly better. I'll give an example of this in a second. I just have to set the scene. So you give them this public key thing and they use that, like they have a little envelope, here's the, their little message that they want to send you. They sign that with your public key. They use your public key on that message to encrypt it, and then they give that to you. And you are able to use your private key to decrypt that message and, and figure out what they sent. All right? That is the setup. And messages and public keys and private keys, everything inside of a computer is ones and zeros. So these are just big numbers. We're translating everything to numbers, and we're doing fancy math. All right? So RSA works because it's based on prime numbers and factorization. So it's very hard to factor numbers. That's a hard computational problem, especially when the numbers are huge. And so the reason RSA is unbreakable for large enough numbers is one, because we don't have, uh, what's it called? Because we don't have quantum computers that work yet. And two, because it's very hard to factor numbers. Okay. So let me show you RSA in a nutshell. You'll have to wait till CSI 26 to fully learn it. But let me just make up some stuff. So it uses what's called modular arithmetic, which involves doing a computation and then using the remainder calculation that I just taught you before. So this is all coming together. So you give a public key to somebody, and it's actually two numbers. It's We call those N and E. So here are my example numbers. Here's N, here's my E. Some, some numbers, they're usually much larger than this. And then you have a private key, and that's the one you keep to yourself. We'll call that D. It's this number. And all these things, your public key and your private key, they're generated from two gigantic prime numbers, all right, that are hard to figure out. And uh, D and E are what are called modular multiplicative inverses. You do not have to understand this, but the idea is that somebody gives, somebody takes a message, call that M, it's a number, and so you translate your text to a number somehow, 
And then they encrypt that by taking it to the power of the, like, the encryption of the public keys, so like E, and then you can decrypt that by taking it to the power of D, your private key, right? And apparently this ends up being M. They're like inverses of each other, even though they're positive numbers. Uh, their inverse is what we say mod, mod N. So they are equivalent if you take the remainder after dividing by N, right? You do not have to understand this, but I'm going to show you a cool example in just a second, right? So the idea is you can send any message between 0 and N minus 1, because that's the result of taking the remainder by dividing by N. Can't go in cleanly. Uh, 0 and 1, you kind of have to exclude those for reasons that you'd understand if you tried this, and uh, doesn't really... That's fine. You just never send the number zero or the number one to anybody. And all right, so here's what you do. To encrypt a message, which is just a number, some, your text is a number, you calculate m to the power of e, and then you do mod n, which is the percent sign, after you do that power computation. And we call that c. c stands for ciphertext, the encoded form of your message. And so let me, here's my example message. Let's, uh, let's say that my message is the number 42. I want to send that securely to somebody, all right? So what I'll do is I'll take that message and take it to the power of my public keys E part. So 42 to the power of 17. Let me calculate that for you really quick. Come on. So it's that giant number. That's fun. Uh, all right, let's take that, and we're going to do mod n on it, so mod 3233. That is apparently 2557, so a much smaller number. That's the remainder after dividing by that. So that's equal to 2557, and that's the encoded text that you'll send to somebody that only I, with my private key, can decrypt. All right, so to decrypt your, your encoded message called a ciphertext, you calculate that, that number that they send you, to the power of your private key and take mod n again. So 2557 to the power of 413 is this giant number that doesn't even fit on my screen. So you have to do that. And then, it's very efficient, uh, very powerful, hard to crack. And then you do mod n again, so mod 3233, take the remainder. And what do you know, this giant number, when you divide by 3233 and get the remainder, you get your 42 right back. And that is the backbone of the internet. That is why you can send your, your messages to Amazon, send your credit card, your password, and you end up with, uh, they end up knowing exactly what you sent, and everybody else just gets to deal with a very large number that they, can, they just don't understand, All right? So that is RSA encryption in a nutshell. Uh, visit the Wikipedia page if you're more interested, but are there any questions or comments about it? This is what's going on on the internet when you talk to every website. Private keys, or public keys are being shared, and then you're sending messages and decrypting with your private keys. All right, so that's encryption. It's encoding stuff. I have, of course, because this is a philosophical kind of lecture, I have a philosophical question for you. Is it ethical? Is it right? Is it good to use encryption to send messages to other people? All right, so let's have a little debate. Dun, dun, dun. Um, let's see. Yeah, so here's here's my job. So again, I would like you to have a little debate with each other on the written ice page. So I'm going to stop the attendance in just a second, make sure to sign in. But please go to the written ice page and I'll go to my admin mode and clear it out. So now I got no posts. So to create, right, you'll work as groups. We'll get into groups with each other, people next to you. And you'll come up with some uh, some arguments, but remember the way to get a group number is to just press submit when it's blank. I'll give you a random number. That's your group number. And so here is what I want you to do. I'm going to split you into two groups, and you will debate this. Is it ethical to use encryption to send messages? All right. I'm going to split you into two groups, for and against. So if you are an even group number, then you must argue for encryption. It is, you're saying, yes, it is ethical to use encryption to send messages to other people or to websites. I'm all for it. And here's why. You'll give arguments, all right? If you are in an odd group number, you are against encryption. 
you have to come up with some reasons why it's a bad thing to encrypt messages that you send to other people or to websites. Okay, so write, try to write uh, two arguments, like come up with as a group two good arguments in support of whatever stance I'm forcing you to have. And then we'll discuss afterwards. All right, try to think about what our boys might think as well. Extra, extra virtual points for that. All right, any questions about what I'm asking you to do? So you're arguing either for or against encryption to send messages either to other people or to uh, programs that then use your information. Okay. So either for or against, write down two good arguments per group, please. And talk to each other, say hi, and come up with some good arguments, please. I'll give you a few minutes to try this. We'll set a timer for, let's say, four minutes. One more minute to get some good arguments in. All right, that is my timer. Let's see what we're thinking. 
discuss it, and then I have a few more topics and an essay for you. All right. So, um, yeah, let's take a look. So our, uh, our odd numbers were against and our even numbers were four. So, yeah, encryption is great because it can protect things that we don't want other people to see, like our credit card numbers or passwords. It makes sense to have those. Good job. Uh, it's bad, though, to send encrypted messages because they have a chance of being intercepted by hackers. So maybe we shouldn't be sending anything encrypted at all. I guess that's one way to argue it. Uh, yeah, uh, encryption is not ethical because in the world of pri privacy, not everyone will understand the messages sent through encryption. Good. Yes, that's that's the main argument against encryption that governments and law enforcement like to use, that if you are a bad person, you are able to profit from encryption and make sure that you talk to only the other bad people, right? And like plan your evil, uh, your evil outings or whatever. That is what encryption is good for sometimes, I guess. And that's one strong argument for why we shouldn't have it, right? So that's a great thing that somebody noticed that. Good job. I think it's ethical to use encryption to send messages because some things need to be kept private. Yeah, that seems to be the standard idea. We want privacy versus some people should not be afforded privacy. Those are the two, the two goals there. Okay, that's the idea. And I think if I read more of these, we'll get the same idea. Good job, Group 21, talking about Kantianism and utilitarianism. That's where I want to go right now. So in the remaining minutes... Let us talk just briefly about no, wrong slides. Let's talk briefly about like what our boys might think. What would Kant say? What would Mill say? So Kant is Kant would be for privacy. Like private info should be remain private. He was for individual rights. Should remain private. And then I think so Kant would be for encryption. And then Mill, you could argue either way, right? You could say privacy is great and that everybody deserves it. And so we should have encryption. Or maybe we should get rid of encryption so that we can always like snoop in on somebody's, like that law enforcement could snoop in on somebody's messages, keep it private for most people, just not law enforcement or something. And that would allow us to protect people from harm. Because if we were to read the bad people's messages, then they would uh, get caught. Right? So that would be an argument against encryption. And so either way, again, you could, you could argue. Any questions about any of that? Good job writing your, your thoughts down. Hopefully that was a nice little debate and we had a chance to, to think critically. So in the remaining few minutes of class, I'd like to talk about a few things. I might have to end up skipping a slide, actually, because I want to talk about your next uh, assignment as well. So let's talk about uh, Chelsea Manning first. Follow her on Twitter if you'd like. Uh, she has a Twitter account that a lot of people follow. Uh, so back in 2010, Chelsea Manning, what she did was she gave that company called WikiLeaks, which is a bit infamous, a lot of classified, almost a million classified or unclassified but sensitive military documents, diplomatic documents, stuff that people weren't allowed to see, all right? So she did that for a reason. Uh, I think there was an issue with, like, this was back with the war in, in Afghanistan. I think there was a lot of civilian casualties that weren't being reported properly, and she wanted to make sure that they were, something like that. And so she leaked a ton of documents. And this leak is ridiculously large, right? Before we had actual, like, these were all floating around on the internet, it would be very hard to copy almost a million documents and give to newspapers, right? It would be so hard. So that is inconceivable. And that was crazy. That that happened. And uh, obviously it is illegal in the U.S. To, to do this kind of thing, to leak classified documents. It's a federal crime. And so she was sentenced to prison uh, for 35 years for this leak, though it was commuted by Obama and she's out now. And so the question is, she did, she leaked all this information even though it was against the law because she thought it would make the world a better place, all right? And so the question is, does it does the value of informing the public outweigh the value of confidentiality, all right? Because that is, that's the, the flip side of things. And so a utilitarianism person might think this way, like confidentiality, uh, we should keep that. We should punish people who leak this stuff because confidentiality 
protects people. Maybe there are some names mentioned that those people can now be targets because they were mentioned in the, this bad stuff going on in these, in this, in these leaks. All right. So that's a problem. Uh, maybe that is for punishment for confidentiality. But uh, the reason Chelsea leaked this stuff was because she thought that getting this information out, again, very close to an election, all right, this was an election year, I think, you would give more information to people who are about to vote and to activists who wanted to make sure that the world was a better place. And that seemed to outweigh the risks for her. More info for voters and activists. So totally look her up on Wikipedia. That's all I have time to talk about right now. Uh, Panama Papers, I think I will skip because I have to release a new assignment to you, but another kind of leak. And then we have Snowden, Edward Snowden, right? He leaked a lot of information as well. He was a contractor for the NSA. He leaked a ton of documents and they were all classified, classified. And back in 2013, he showed that the NSA was spying on U.S. citizens, which they were not allowed to do. That was against the law. They had back doors in popular services like, like Facebook and stuff that people were using that they didn't know about. Uh, these services were thought to be encrypted by the people who used them. All right. So the U.S. was doing a bad thing. He showed that uh, he brought this to light. And uh, he was eventually, because it, all this stuff was classified, he was tried or he was indicted, I guess. He was indicted for espionage, this kind of leak, because it's against the law to do this. And he is currently still living in Russia with his wife to avoid prosecution because of what he did. And so the question is, was it worth it? Should he have done that? Was it the right thing to do? Okay. So definitely look him up and I'm going to force you to look him up because here is your final, uh, the thing that I want to talk about today, your next writing assignment. So you have an essay due. Here's your next essay. It's about Snowden. Again, a right or wrong kind of question that has no right answer. Should he have done this? Should he not have done this? So here is my prompt for you. It's a 500 word, a nice short essay uh, for week four. Uh, this will be due week six, so two weeks on the 14th, so Valentine's Day. Uh, was it right? Here's your prompt. Was it right for Snowden to blow the whistle on the NSA? Should he have done that? And so answer that, as well as answer, do we have a right to privacy on the internet? Because the internet is a public utility, just like our power lines, just like our phone lines. PG&E is like monitoring how much power we're using, and nobody says that that's a bad thing. Why is the internet different? Tell me why, if it is, all right, if you think so. And so respond to that prompt in 500 words. I don't care which stance you take. Obviously, I'll give you full credit if you argue your point well. That's what I said before, and I am very, very clear on that now. All right. So you got to mention both sides of the argument, no matter which side of the argument you care about, whichever one you're, you're propping up. And uh, you better argue in favor of those sides or against those sides. Okay. You got to talk about both sides and you're not required to talk about Kantianism or utilitarianism, but you might want to. And also you need to cite a source, at least one source in your essay. We still have a minute and a half. Stay in your seats. Cite at least one source in your essay, please. All right. That is, uh, that is what I want to say. The one rule, as usual, don't cite Wikipedia. Cite the places that Wikipedia cites. Go to those websites. Read those real articles. All right? That's what I'm forcing you to do. So if you cite Wikipedia, I will give you no credit for your citation. That is, I think, all that I want to say. Any questions about this essay assignment? 500 words on whistleblowing, on the right to privacy. Yeah, question. No, I mean, I'd still grade it. I'd still, I'd love to read it. I'd give you credit, but uh, you'd just be doing more work than you needed to, going above and beyond. Yeah, yes. This will be due, if you have no extensions applied to you, on the 14th, so two weeks from now, week six. So we are here two Tuesdays from now, or three technically. Yeah? All right, if there are no other questions, that's all I have for you. You can leave a whole 15 seconds early.